Luke chapter 15, I want to go ahead and read the text with you. Luke chapter 15, this is one of the most famous stories in the whole Bible. It's the story of the prodigal son, except there's actually two lost sons here. And the Bible says in, in chapter 15, verse 11, that Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to, in the, to, to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's ser hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your, 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 um, to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But he didn't get the rest of it out. His father interrupted him and said, But the father said to his servants, Quick, everybody say quick. Quick, quick bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come home, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. This is a fascinating line. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. That's a lie. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. That's a lie. But when this son of yours, not my brother, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home. You killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate. Everybody say, had to celebrate. We had to celebrate and be glad because your brother, this brother of yours, come on. This brother of yours, everybody say, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was found. I think one of the most glaring issues in this whole story is the gap between the older brother's heart and the father's heart. Amen. That gap, it's massive. And you're like, how can you live in the same house and have such a different heart than the father has? So I almost titled this sermon, Dad, What Do You Want? And that would be a good, good title. I decided to shift it because I think it's, it's, there's a deeper issue here. And I want, to write, I want you to write down this phrase, what the Father desires. What the Father desires. If you figure that out while you're alive, you're very blessed. Let's pray. Hmm. Father, the best example I have is like if we were throwing a 75th birthday party for each one of our dads, who would be invited to the party? What would be the food? What would be the music? Who is not invited? All the competing attention for who remembered what. and We, we just don't have good paradigms for understanding how to get to the heart of our own fathers, much less you. So, Lord, I don't know if I would have been any better than the younger brother or the older brother. And so, Lord, I'm just coming to the front porch today. And I want to see what you see the way you see it. And I know 
My friends came to hear from you and not a man. So we ask you to speak in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, high five your neighbor and just say, welcome to church. Welcome to church. Well, if you're taking notes today, I want you to write this down. If you're not taking notes today, I want you to write this down. (laughs) Three things the Father desires. And the first one is this. It's a Kazaza, Kazaza free family. A Kazaza free family. Now, Kazaza is not a word that probably anybody uses ever. And I'd be surprised if you've actually even heard this word. It's a Hebrew word, but it's Kazaza. Kazaza. Everybody say Kazaza. Kazaza, one more time, Kazaza. The word Kazaza, it means the cutting off. It means the cutting off. So um, a couple of things I want to give you just as, as a, like a paradigm, just to kind of take a look at references, is that the Bible is made up of 66 books, right? And the very first five letters or five books of the Bible are called the Torah. Everybody say Torah. All right, so the Torah, it's it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? And so the Torah has a lot of rules in there called the laws of God, the oracles of God. They're the standards of God. Well, there's another book that, come on, it's not like the the players, it's it's, it's not like the, the, the rule book, it's all of the rules for how to keep the rules. And so if you wanna know like, all the rules for how to keep the rules, you wouldn't go to the Torah. You would go to the Talmud. Everybody say Talmud. The Talmud was 700 and something different laws, rules for how to keep the Torah. So if it says thou shalt not murder, then it would have lots of teachings for how to not murder. (laughs) And if it says that somebody violated the Sabbath, it wouldn't just say they should be cut off from the society or cut off from the community. It would have all the details, the rules for how to cut them off. If somebody was to be kicked out of the family, there would be rules for how to kick somebody out. Well, this word kazaza is a word that's mentioned in the Talmud, but it's not a word that's mentioned in the Torah. And so in the Talmud, in the list of rules for how to keep the law, there were laws about forbidden things that people marry. If you have a son and he marries someone that's not approved by the father, then the Talmud would have a rule for what to do to that son if he ever tried to come back home after rebelling against the father. Likewise, there were rules for if you have an inheritance that you give to a son or the oldest son, really we get a double portion, the second son would get, you know, one portion. And so if if you actually are giving an inheritance and if the village deems that the person that gets the inheritance spends it in a way that is unworthy of the father, then the whole village would do something called kazaza. And I thought about bringing out a clay pot today and putting a stone like on the platform because the picture here is that the whole village, the elders of the village, if the person was to ever come and try to enter into the community again, then what would happen is they would fill this huge clay pot up with the most rank, stank smell of stuff. I'm talking about dead fish, eggs, and everything else. I mean, whatever they can put in there, they would smell, all right? And they would come out before the whole community. They would meet him at the gate of the community before he even got back in. If they saw him, it was like kazaza. It wasn't shoot him. You would go take this clay pot and you would smash the clay pot on the ground at the feet of this person to shame them and tell them you are cut off from this community forever. And the way that you're cut off, the community is broken, the family is broken, and look at the shattered pieces of this clay pot. That is the standard, that is the condition of our relationship. Broken forever, cut off. Kazaza. And so you have this, this battle going on where in some way you know this. If, you, if you've read scripture a lot, you, you're aware of this, that somewhere inside that Jewish leaders who want Jesus to stop welcoming sinners, he wants to expose something in their Talmud. And there's something in their Talmud that is preventing them from celebrating someone they think should be cut off. So Jesus says, what if there's a lost sheep? You go find it. They're like, oh, cool story. I'm not a shepherd. Find a lost sheep. And then a woman loses a coin. Okay, we get that. But now there's a lost son. And they don't just destri- describe something shameful. They describe something that's unimaginable. There's a guy by the, in the name of Kenneth Bailey. And Kenneth Bailey wrote one of the best books I've read on the story of the prodigal son. And in his book, there's this quote where he says, in all of the Middle Eastern literature from ancient times into present, 
There is no case of any son, older or younger, asking for his inheritance from a father who is still in good health. Which means Jesus came up with a story that is not just unimaginable. It's never happened in human history to this day. You go and ask people, how many of you would dare go to your father who's in good health and ask him for your inheritance while he's still alive and in good health? Who would dare? And they would say, it's such a shameful thing. No one would even imagine doing such a thing. Yet Jesus said, this is the example I want to give you. Because if anyone deserved kazaza, it's the younger brother. And I started thinking about like each time that I've actually wanted something from God more than I wanted God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever wanted God to give you comfort, save America? Come on, somebody. Lower interest rates. Give us a new president. I don't know. <laughs> Stop something, do something, cause something, answer something. And you only pray when you want something. What Jesus is exposing here is there's definitely two lost sons. One of them's lost because he took what was the father's, and he asked for it, the father gave it to him, and he went out and just squandered it. And the other one didn't, but I, I'm going to paint like something about the older brother in a second, but I want to ask you a question. What takes people so long to come home? <laughs> like imagine that you've come home before, and you've actually experienced the love of God. You've experienced his grace and his mercy, but you went out again. And you come back and you receive grace and mercy and forgiveness and restoration. But within like 72 hours, you went out again. Do you understand? Jesus is painting a picture here that's so extreme. It's to make you think the front porch is somewhere I really want to be. Yet for every single one of us, you're just like the guy, the, older, the younger brother. Every one of you are. Because sin always takes you further than you wanted to go. It always keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. It always costs you more than you ever want to pay. And it always hurts you deeper than you ever wanted to hurt. Come on, how many of y'all would agree sin's a liar? How many of you would also agree that sin's pretty fun? Would y'all agree? I mean, if you don't think sin was fun, you just weren't that good at it. You know what I mean? Like, for real, sin's fun. It feels good for a season. But the boy isn't coming home, not because sin isn't fun or because sin is fun or anything. The boy's not coming home for the same reason that you don't come home. It's because there's a voice that just hits you over the heart that says, no matter how many times you go home, you're never going to change. You can't change. You are prodigal. You are lost. You are. You are. You are. I would have you write this phrase down. Shame is the number one reason it takes us so long to wake up and come home. Shame. So I want to break something down to you because I want you to get this picture. I want you to get how drastic it is. Like what I would, what I would have you like consider is the older brother had what I'd call the John Bon Jovi mindset. Come on, everybody say John Bon Jovi. Y'all remember that, that song the great theologian John Bon Jovi wrote? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say the first part and you finish it. Ready? Shot through the heart and you're to blame. Darling, you what? All right, let's sing it. Ready? You get, no, don't. <laughs> when I think of like people that have actually ruined the name of something, I mean, it's, you, 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 we could all come up with a list of people that actually gave something a bad name. Like all of us, you know, Remember, there's several stories. I'll give you one, but one, I'll give you a few. One is Lance Armstrong. And Lance Armstrong, we love Lance Armstrong. Whenever, you know, he's battling cancer and he's overcoming, you know, his, his struggles in life. And we're all praying for him and love all this. And then we find out that he's one of the greatest abusers of drugs ever. We're like, man, you gave cycling a bad name. <laughs> you gave bike racing a really bad name. You, you look at, at, at a lot of Tanya Harding, you know, what she did in the, in the, in the Olympics and ice skating. And, and you look at O.J. Simpson. Come on. Like, there's so many things that his behavior, like, kazaza, bro. Like, you're trying to come back in the NFL. Poor old Pete Rose, man. He gambled and he lost, his, he lost everything because he bet on a baseball game. You're like, he lost more than some of these other people have lost. Like, you don't, you don't lose your Hall of Fame status, and, and some, and, but you're like, man, you, you did such a disgrace to the sport that we can't even say your name in relationship to the sport anymore. 
Tiger Woods hit that deal whenever he, he abused his wife. He beat her and he disappeared in the middle of the night and he had that lapse of drugs and all those things. It's like I mean, you, you tainted the name of the sport. And what the older brother would say is the only thing that my brother or your son deserves is kazaza. He gives you a bad name, Father. He gives our whole estate a bad name. He must pay kazaza. But the father's desire is revealed in this. He gave me a bad name. He deserves kazaza, but I'm going to pay the price. And what Jesus would say very clearly, like very clearly, I came to know the father's desire and to pay the price for everyone to miss out on kazaza. I want a kazaza free, shame free front porch family. You're like, I want to uh, teach me more about this. Well, let me show you what the father did and compare that to the putrid smell of a shattered vase at your feet. Imagine a whole crowd running toward you to shame you because of one sin. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2 says that your sins have separated you from God. Your iniquities have hidden his face from you. Is the arm of the Lord too short to save you? No, but your sins have hidden his face. There's a, there's a consequence for one sin. One sin separates you from God. One. Not how bad it is. I don't know where we came up with these like sins of omission and sins of commission and good ones and bad ones. There's none of that. One sin. Like all she did was eat an apple or a pear or a fig or something. She just ate a piece of fruit. No, she had pride in her heart. She rebelled. And that one act of rebellion caused the entire human race to fall. Yet God didn't go and punish them. God didn't go and slap them. God didn't go and shame them. He slaughtered an animal and covered them from the very beginning. And he did the same thing with you. You're like... Well, that guy, your son, deserves kazaza. Read this verse with me. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was a long way off, still a long way off, which means before anybody could even possibly run to him with a vessel to shatter on the ground, his father saw him before the village saw him. His father saw him. And splotna. Everybody just put your hand on your belly for a second. Some of y'all got a lot more touch than others. I got a whole lot here. Have you ever been embarrassed by a belly growling? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, just indigestion. You know, it's, 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 not, it, it's ambiguous where the noise is coming from. Can I get an amen? What was that? Oh, I don't know what it was. <laughs> it's something's moving in the stomach. The word splotna. Everybody say splotna. Splotna is a Greek word for moving in the stomach. It's what it means, which means the belly of heaven began to move. And you think, how would the story be if the father ran to him with a vessel? What would you do if you saw the father running to you with a vessel? I promise you, the first thing the boy sees, the father is running to him is, oh, oh my goodness, dad's kicking up his pants and running down the road. He doesn't have a vessel, though. He doesn't. Nobody else. This is really awkward. And then the Bible says that he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. That literally means he fell on him, moved in his inner being, and fell on him. Then it says, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But he didn't even have time to apologize for everything he'd done. How many of y'all would agree if your kids actually did something wrong when they were about seven or eight and they apologized, they couldn't possibly apologize to you at the level that they did wrong. All they can do is say, I'm sorry. What are you sorry for? Uh, I'm sorry for hitting... My brother, no, you're sorry for what? <laughs> they couldn't even get the language out. And the father's like, you know what? I'm not saving any of you because of how accurate your prayer is. I know your heart before you even start running home. I, I know what makes you not want to come home. And I know what it took for you to get on that road. <laughs> and I don't know. Your motive wasn't even good, bro. You wanted a job and you didn't want to eat pig food anymore. Like, I, I let you get to that point. Come on, somebody. 
And the Bible says he ran to him, threw his arms on him and kissed him. And then the the son said a little prayer, I guess. And it says, but the father said to his servants, quick. Everybody say quick. Quick. Why quick? Before the city finds out. Before the religious leaders find out. Before anybody gets their clay pots ready. Quick. Quick. Restore him before anybody gets a chance to shame him. Quick. God doesn't make you sit on a mourner's bench for one month before he decides to apply the blood of Jesus to you. He didn't wait on you to get all your ducks in a row and confess all your sin and have all your sins of omission and sins of commission and all your penance. You can't pay. You can't do a thing. Your heart is so flawed. God's the one who wins you over. He's the one who stirs you by his spirit to come to your senses. The fact you come to your senses means you are born again. You have to be born again before you can even confess. He bore, he, he, his spirit hits your heart. It's boom. You're like, I don't even know what. I'm not sitting here another day. I'm moving home. You start moving home. You don't even know why. It's because God's love has won you over. Come on, praise him. He's won you over. Like, I don't even know why I came to church today. Man, I saw somebody at church recently. I'm like, I, I walked past them. I walked past them and went and shook hands with somebody. And I came back and introduced myself to them. I haven't seen them in four years. And I said, hey, I'm Jeff Jenkins. And when they told me their name, I started weeping because I haven't seen them in four years. And I know how hard it was for that person to get on the road and come home. And I hugged him and he just sobbed. had a big old wet spot on my shirt. And I was like, man, you have no idea how much I love you. I'm so glad you're here. And he just wept and wept and wept. And I'm like, why'd you do that, Pastor Jeff? Because that's what you would want. If somebody wrote your name on the wall out there, the make room wall, and been praying for you. Come on, some of y'all need to go out there to the wall and make sure your name ain't on there. Somebody wrote, somebody wrote Bo on there. <laughs> and Pastor Bo's joking, like, I think my wife ratted me out, wrote my name on the, on the wall. You're like, what are you talking about? We have a make room wall right when you walk in the sanctuary. And that make room wall is individuals that our church is praying for, people we're praying for to come home. People we're praying for to be saved. People we're praying for to leave the pig pen. People we're praying for to give grace a chance to listen to the whisper of the Father, to come home. Man, Man I, just, I just thought, why, why, would I, why would I do anything else? I mean, I'm just telling you, man, you bust out one vessel with a putrid smell on any human being that's coming home to be forgiven and receive grace. Like, it's not a good day for you spiritually. But it says here clearly that the, the Father said, get the best robe The best robe is totally restoring his identity and his access, his placement in the family. That's a big deal to receive that robe. The second thing is a ring. It's like a signet ring. It's like getting a credit card or keys to the truck or keys to the company business. You got got a key fob, baby. You got unlimited access, spending power, purchasing power. You You got the signet ring of the family. You got a name tag, belong. You got all this on you. Then he says, put sandals on his feet, which means he has no shoes on. Why put sandals? Because the sandals belong on the feet of sons and daughters and bare feet belong to servants. And he's like, no, 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 you came home to be a servant, but I've restored you as a son. I'm bringing you into sonship. I'm totally restoring you day one. I'm not even letting you finish your repentance prayer. Come home, boy. This is a big deal. And then he says, kill the fattened calf. The fattened calf? I'm like, man, I knew God's going to have barbecue in heaven. Come on, somebody. I know, but I'm just telling you, man, you call it Hutchins barbecue, and it's like spread out it all. Why? Because my boy's home. He's home. It's a big deal. I'm like, man, this is a big deal. Hmm. Like, what if the older brother got this, that the father desires a shame-free family, and he actually gets glory? in removing shame. What if the older brother understood? Point number two, the father desires for the lost to be saved. Now this is a big one. The Bible tells us in John chapter five and verse 19 that Jesus says, I only do what I see the father doing. And I only say what I hear the father saying which means he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit so he could do cool stuff. He was filled with the Holy Spirit so he could always know what the Father desires. And I wonder, 
How often would you have visited the front porch and had a chat with the father, knowing the entire estate is yours? The inheritance is all yours. Do you think the older brother even thought about praying or talking to the, old, the father about the son? I started thinking about this, this verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. Like, read it with me. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people, everybody say all people, all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So imagine the older brother just coming one day to the front porch and sitting down and talking to the father and saying something like this. Dad, what do you want? What do you want today? I can promise you this. He would say, son, pray. He'd say, that's kind of what I'm doing. Keep praying. I haven't seen you in a while. Well, what do you want me to do, dad? Pray. How long? Until you get my desire. Dad, I saw that robe on the front porch. What you got that out for? Pray. I am praying. What's that robe for? It's for your younger brother. Ugh. How long would you pray for somebody you don't want saved that the father wants to be saved? Hey, Dad, what's the ring doing? Like, how can, is the ring for him too? Yeah. The, sho the shoes? Yeah. What else is for him? Hutchins barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Keep praying. Keep praying. I love this verse because it, it stirs up controversy in Christians. Some of you grew up in a Baptist doctrine, Presbyterian doctrine, different denominations, and you understand Calvinism. Some of you understand what's known as Arminianism. Some of you have grew, grown up studying, like, what is predestination? What good does it do to pray for somebody that God's going to save anyway or he's not going to save? And for a lot of people from a Calvinist standpoint, they'd be like, you know, God's going to save who he's want to save. And I don't really know how to handle a God who's sovereign and wants to save everybody. And some people who would look at this very verse and they would say, because if you read verse 1 through 2, it says, make intercession for kings and leaders and authorities of all, all, all people. And so a lot of people say, it's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, people kind of write that off saying he desires not universalism, he just desires that all kinds of people be saved. And the more Arminians, they would say something like this. He doesn't just desire that all people be saved. He desires all kinds of people. He desires all people be saved. And it's kind of up to us to go share him with people, to turn the light on for people, and you're like, well, what good does it do if God's going to say, no, 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 no. He's like, like, stop thinking about like why and how and all those things. Can you just get God's heart for people? Yes. Yeah. And, and there's some things that God wants to do and wants to say for his own glory. There's some things he allows to happen and some people he allows to wallow a long time. And there's all kinds of reasons he does what he does. He says in Isaiah chapter 40, 48 and verse 9 through 11, for my name's sake, I defer my anger. <laughs> for my, aim, my, my name, for my name, it's like there's, there's something about the desire of the Father that's more important than, than anything we can comprehend. Yes, there's some people he wants you praying for that you don't even know why. Yes, there's some people he wants saved that you could care less if they existed. There's some people you want off the face of the earth and you, you cannot even bring up a king or a sovereign leader or a Republican or Democrat or whoever disagrees. You can't even bring them up, man. You, you want, you want, Kazaza. 
And I'm just saying, if you have a Kazaza heart, come to the porch until you get the Father's heart. And just ask him, Lord, well, how, do you, how do you love me? And God says, there's some things I do and I restrain it for you that I might not cut you off. Behold, I've refined you, but not as silver. I've tried you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. Yes. Like, God, why are you so good to me? I, if I told you, you wouldn't even know. Why was I born in this family? They did it for my name's sake. Why did I get these parents for my name's sake? Why do I have these tendencies for my name's sake? Why, why am I so lost and alone? Why is shame so heavy on my heart for my name's sake? There's some things I'm allowing because when you break, baby, God's got a lot of people just like you. He wants you to go back and redeem. He wants you to go share him with. He wants you to love. Oh, don't be golf clapping, Jesus. Go ahead and praise him. Come on, somebody. He didn't save you to actually make you comfortable in an American Texas church. Point number three. I mean, I'll get to point three in a second. Look, shame is the number one reason it takes us so long to wake up and come home. I said that earlier, but I want you to write this down. You are never more like Christ than when you desire that all people come to salvation. Amen. Never. Jesus is constantly interceding for who? And why in the world is the Son of God interceding to the Father? That's how the Trinity works. The Son's interceding. The Father is moved. The Spirit is acting. It's a constant work of the Trinity. The Son is interceding. The Word is moving. The Father's heart. The Son is active. The Spirit is being activated all over the earth. What is the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the Father that the Father is sending His Spirit to move your tail into action? What care is He wanting to put inside of your heart? What burden is He filling you with today? You're like, I'm not really feeling. Oh, yes, you are. You came to church on the right day today. This is the move of God that's happening in our city. And I'm, ta- I'm not talking about some move that everybody, ta- no, no, I'm talking about simple hearts, turning our hearts. Father, what do you desire? Yeah. Point number three is this. The Father desires for the saved to reach the lost. Yeah. The Father desires for the saved to reach the lost. Go back to the Father again with me. Dad, Dad. What's that robe for? It's for your brother. Really? Really? Is he coming home? Do you feel the difference? Dad, what's that ring for? It's for for your brother. Really? Is he coming home? Dad, what are the the shoes for? It's for your brother. Is Is he coming home? Yeah, that fattened calf out there. Well, I thought that was for like my wedding. Oh, not if your brother comes home first. <laughs> really? Like, why is the band always practicing it's for your brother? Why are we having dance practice every day? It's for your brother. Dad, I want to do whatever I can to reach him. What can I do? Because you have my heart. Now go. Because if you go to try to reach the lost without the Father's heart, you may cause them to be more lost than they were in the first place. But when you get the desire of the Father, you will, you'll be like, listen, I'm just telling you, there's a robe at the house for you. There's, there's, no, there's no way I'm getting the robe. You, you're getting the robe, bro. There's, there's, there's shoes at the house for you, too. Shoes? No, oh, I, I just want to be a servant. No, 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 no. God, God, God restores sons. Yeah, yeah. Amen. He restores sons. Amen. He makes them servants. There's a ring for you too, buddy. Amen. Ring? What do you mean? Like f- f- full act? There's no way. I can't go home. Listen, if you hurry home, we all get to eat the fattened calf. We all do. We, it's bar- barbecue all day long yeah. when you come home. Really? Yeah. Well, what about Kazaza? That's no longer in the family. That's no longer in the family. Father, I've been talking to him a lot, and we have a Kazaza-free family. And I just want to, I want you to read this verse in Acts 26. It's where the Lord Jesus leads the Apostle Paul from being a Kazaza man. The Apostle Paul was full of Kazaza, killing Christians, not just shattering pots, killing them arresting them, putting them in prison, kazaza. He was on a mission sent from the Sanhedrin to go arrest Christians and put them in prison, kazaza. 
But the Lord Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, won his heart, saved him, filled him with the Holy Spirit, and told him this, I am sending you to open their eyes. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, baptism of the Holy Spirit, when that Spirit hits your heart, cuts off the sins of the flesh, fills you immediately with the DNA of heaven, gives you the heart of the Father, and you start talking like you've never talked before. You start longing, praying, seeing people like you've never seen them before. You start to imagine a world like you've never imagined it before. He gives you supernatural powers, which are called gifts of the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't activate you with all the gifts without his heart. He wants to give you his desire today. And watch what Jesus says to the Apostle Paul. Jesus says this, I am sending you. He says, I am sending you to open their eyes. You mean God uses me to open people's eyes? Yeah. And... So they may turn from darkness to light. You mean he uses me to help people come to their senses? Yeah. And from the power of Satan to God, he uses me to get people out of the grasp of Satan? That they may receive forgiveness of sin. He uses me to get people forgiven? and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He uses me to help people get sanctified, totally cleansed, covered, washed in the blood of Jesus as if they'd never sinned. Yeah. Well, Pastor Jeff, I got a question for you. This is a great sermon. Moving. What if the brother would have came home with the prostitutes and asked the father to accept his lifestyle? What if the son would have come home and tried to change the rules of the house, redefine language? What if the son would have come home and said, I'm not your son, I'm your daughter? And do you understand the difference? The church today is being forced by a political movement to totally accept the world as they are and allow lifestyles to change the definitions of not only the Talmud, but the Torah and the word of Christ itself. I'm calling you right now to lay down everything you want to cling to. Empty your heart completely and say, God, you made me. I'm coming home. A hundred percent. And there's no, there's, no, there's no bashing. There's no shaming. You're like, Pastor Jeff, like I, I've done worse than what the prodigal son did. So have I. So have I. Hey, thank you for watching Anchor Church YouTube. I want you to subscribe so that we can let you know when we go live and also when we post new content. Make sure also to leave a comment. Let us know what ministered to you today. Also let us know where you're watching from and how we can pray for you. And finally, if you'd like to support Anchor right now, you can click the link below and your partnership will help impact so many others. I'll see you next time, my friend. God bless you and best ahead.